It's funny because we're called organizers, but how I see it is you cannot organize until you've decluttered. It's like organizing is the driver's license and decluttering is the learner's license. And you can't organize, which is what everyone wants to do, until you declutter. So people get stuck because they're like, oh, I want to get organized, but they have to deal with the clutter first. And that's the hard part. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Mark Groves Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Megan Golightly, who is the founder of Simplified. Megan is one of the most popular organizing and decluttering specialists in North America. Okay, well, that I'm sure for people listening, if you got a clutter issue, listen, I'll just out myself, I sometimes clutter. And having you on, I'm super pumped about because you take this merger of neuroscience, psychology, and mix and interweave it so we can understand why we hold on to things, why we clutter, which I'm looking forward to some insights into my own psyche and my own housekeeping. So welcome, Megan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's get into this. And for you listening, stick with this because you might be like, I don't want to hear about my clutter. I don't want to hear about the psychological you know, correlations to that. But that's precisely what we're, I'm going to stick with it. So how do you see that overlap? I'm curious, where do we even begin with this? Well, I, I passionately believe, I mean, I organized and decluttered people's homes for 14 years. I still do. But as I started working with people, I realized that without understanding the mechanics of us a bit, just dealing with the things doesn't really work. Plus we can't even do it. We get paralyzed. So I really backed it up and started to look at what are the barriers? Why do we hit them and what to do about them? And it's neuroscience. It's we're hunters and gatherers. It goes against our grain, right? But it's the thing we need the most sometimes is to let go or permission to let go. Yeah. I was going to say, let's dive deeper into that. How does the hunter gathering Bring us to our evolution. Now we can at least blame evolution. So I like this. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get in. Well, think about it. When we lived in tribes, the more we had, the safer we were, kind of. I mean, it's what you talk about too. It's once you click on and you can think about it in a different way, it starts to make so much more sense about why we should let go of it and why we hang on to it. But back it up. We're hunters and gatherers. We hang on to things kind of to survive. And we don't live in that world anymore. So we don't need the things like we used to, but we still have that nature in us. So we have to ask ourselves different questions to shed it. Because if we talk about the story, about the story, about the story of why to keep it, we're never going to get rid of it. Much like you talk about relationships, right? You have to shift your perspective. I feel like we're just moving right now. And I was just packing the house. And I was thinking about keeping things like I had. So as you say, the the story or the reason for keeping. And I just kept thinking to myself, like, I always have this story. And I still haven't worn this thing. <laughs> you know, like, I will one day wear this. It's like, I'm sure we all, well, not anyone who's had their house cleaned by you. But most of us have items of clothing or memorabilia, maybe that we just don't let go of. And is it like, do we psychologically, is it free to carry these things or is there a cost? That's just what I was going to say is if there is no cost to you, which usually there is, like you kind of kid yourself that there's no cost, but usually it costs you your time because you're managing the managing of it. You're mentally looking at it and you're making that decision in your head and talking about it to yourself, but you're not making the physical decision and getting it out. So it steals your time. It steals your space. It steals your money, it steals your energy, it affects your physical health and your mental health. There's a study done by UCLA that says that women's stress is directly, their cortisol is directly related to how many things they have in their house. That actually doesn't surprise me. Yeah. And men, not so much though. <laughs> men call it their stuff and it's okay, right? But women, it affects. So communication becomes important. And these are all of the things that I like to focus in on my Instagram and in my how-to guides because they're the things that we think we should know how to do because we can breathe and walk and talk, but no one's taught us these things. Yeah. You don't go to how to let go school, much like you don't go to the school of how to look after your heart, which is what your page is all about. So, you know, people think that they learn from their parents, but what they really learn from their parents sometimes 
God bless their parents, is to hang on for the wrong reasons because their parents grew up during the depression or they immigrated. So they had to hang on to it. But we're not really in that space right now. So it becomes this conundrum of what to do. And that's what I talk about on my Instagram is new questions to ask yourself so it's easier to let go. So that you snap out of that story and get into reality. Where do you even begin? Because I just want to note too that you were speaking about how women and men sort of process cluttering or like holding on to things differently or like the busyness of a house doesn't impact our cortisol as much. And I think about, I shared a meme recently that had like the type of person you are and it was your bedside table. And one, you know, one partner has like all the shit on there and the other ones is clean and pristine and it's sort of you know, it's so true. I, the reason I found the meme is because Kai sent it to me and just said you, because it, I am more of the cluttery nightstand. So where do we even begin, though, to even explore this? Because, you know, I think about how often people become hoarders after they've experienced trauma in their life, or even as nice. you were saying, like they grew up in extreme poverty, so they hold on to things. And that's a there's a beautiful sort of pathology to that, you know, because there's a fear of not having enough. So we accumulate, I mean, I have a friend whose parents, when we were growing up, they grew up in extreme poverty, the mother. So she would go to Costco and literally buy freaking everything. And then the food would go bad. And, you know, you try to talk to her about it, but there wasn't a willingness to look in into that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's tricky. Someone just wrote me something this morning and they said, you asked yesterday what makes it so hard to let go of the things. I thought about it all night and realized that the people who are connected to the things are gone. And I'm afraid to let go of the stuff as I feel then they are really gone. It makes no sense at all as the stuff just lives in boxes. I'm not using it or even looking at it it becomes an anchor that weighs me down. She just wrote that to me today. So there is a cost. And so what we need to do is train our brains, baby steps. I'm not telling people to get rid of everything all at once, but start to look at how, start to look at those reasons, those things that you're telling yourself that are the story about the story of just in case, or I'm a perfectionist, so I'm scared to do anything. It's easier to make no decision than to make a decision. It's easier for me to make no decision. And yeah, it's so true, but it isn't right. Like, is it? Some people, I might get it wrong. So I'd rather make no decision. I think people do that in relationships too. Like they are so afraid to stay or leave. And so it's easier just to do nothing right? Because then there's not really a consequence. Yeah. They don't have to face whatever it is that they're avoiding by holding on. Yeah, I know. But you're so quiet. Like I think I'm striking a chord with all the clutter talk with you. <laughs> well, you are because I see it so much. I've seen it growing up. I am definitely more cluttery than Kylie, like not even a question. And even the way that we keep the house. Like I have no problem leaving keys and a bunch of things on a counter. And she's good that like we can organize. We learn to work together where I am tidier for her mental health and she allows a little more of my clutter for so that I don't, you know, I can feel some sense of freedom, if that's even the right word. But yes, we begin to even enter this point of inquiry of like, why do I hold on to things? What am I holding on to? So when you're working with people, and I'm curious, did your passion for tidying up start with the psychological recognition or did you did you discover that over time that you were like, oh, we're actually healing a bunch of stuff here? Yes. You know, it's funny because we're called organizers, but how I see it is you cannot organize until you've decluttered. It's like organizing is the driver's license and decluttering is the learner's license. And you can't organize, which is what everyone wants to do, until you declutter. So people get stuck because they're like, oh, I want to get organized, but they have to deal with the clutter first. And that's the hard part right? It's really mental. So where do you start? I say, as Jasper grows up too, you start having the discussion around him of, do I love this thing? Do I use this thing? Would I buy this thing again today? Like, how does this serve me now? And sometimes let go of the fact that we used to cook a lot with cookbooks, but losing all of the cookbooks doesn't take our ability to cook away. Mm -hmm. We still are who we are. And shedding boxes and boxes and boxes of things that we've inherited from our parents that we never use, they're in our hearts. 
you can't take them from us. So you have to trust, I think, that those memories are in your heart, not in things. Well, I think when you have boxes and boxes and boxes of things of your grandparents and your parents, and you identify with the person in those things, which you do because it was their things, but you're not using them ever. They're just taking up your space so that you can't park your car in the garage. You have to remember that that person is in your heart, not in the things. And letting go of the things isn't going to make you lose the memory necessarily. So take pictures or do a memory book of your family so that your family actually can enjoy it. I had my wedding dress forever. That's one that is a trigger for a lot of women. I hung on to it for all sorts of reasons. Trauma, marriage didn't work. I paid a lot of money for it. The money's gone. I'm not getting it back. You know, guilt, shame, fear. I thought my dad walked me down the aisle. He's passed away. I had a picture of him walking me down the aisle, but somehow I felt keeping the dress would honor him. But if he knew what it was causing me, the shame and the guilt and whatever, he would say, get rid of the dress, right? So it is interesting the weight it can cause, but we just don't know how to let go. I would imagine the impact of that too physiologically is we're not confronting things. We're being reminded of the weight of whatever it is that we're carrying. I would imagine it correlates, you were saying to, if it correlates to elevated cortisol, especially chronically elevated cortisol, that's not good for us. I mean, I remember being in the house of a friend when I was growing up and the parents were hoarders and the house was insane. I was just like, how? My friend was so ashamed of it that you would like go to his room and it was super tidy. But he was super ashamed of his house. And we never really talked about it, you know, not till we were adults. But as kids, I just remember being like, "This, is, how does someone live in this? But, you know, have you cleaned hoarders homes? I have worked to help clear out homes of people who did collect a lot of things after they passed away when the kids have to deal with it. And that's a sad situation too. You know, a hoarder really is somebody who keeps multiples of the same thing. And that was happening here. You know, there was collections of things that you could never use, but it was really sad for the family to have to pay for it to get all removed. And in the meantime, try my job was to try to find the few special pieces amongst it all. And, you know, it's a lot for a family. So there was a cost, right? There was a cost for the family. And a lot of people, a lot of people don't recognize that cost when they're in it. Now, hoarding is something that I don't necessarily work with a lot, Mark, because I am not a psychologist and usually therapy is needed. Mm -hmm. I can do the job and I can coach for sure at a very high level. And I've been doing it forever successfully and people feel great and say, why didn't we do that sooner? But Hoarding is a, a different, a whole different category. What is it that you normally see in terms of the challenges when you enter someone's home and you're talking to them about whatever it is? Like, I imagine hiring you is kind of like one of those steps where they're like, we're ready to confront this thing. But a lot of people will never hire someone to organize their home or will never even declutter it. So I'm curious, uh, one, what gets in the way of hiring someone like you or even decluttering their home? And then what is the main challenge that you see? when you start? I just keep thinking about you too and what you do. You know, what stops somebody to get help or seek help with their heart? It just reaches a point where it's just too much and it's interfering too much. So they call us or they buy my how-to guide. It takes you through all of the same steps. You just don't have to pay the money. It probably doesn't happen as fast, but all of the steps are there and all of the psychological support is there of why you're hanging on to it, new questions to ask. But they book a call. And I think what's really important is they've booked a call. They've made a commitment to themselves. It's in their calendar. So that's what I always encourage people to do without me is to book book the time, right? Honor yourself, value yourself. You're more important than the things, but make that appointment and commit to it so that you will follow through and do it. If you haven't heard me talk about Cozy Earth Sheets before, let me tell you, I'm about to introduce you to the greatest sheets you will ever have touch your body. Anytime someone comes to our house and stays in our guest room, they always want to know what is the bed situation? What are the sheets that we have? Their sheets, their comforters, their duvets, everything is magic. Their bedding is naturally breathable. It's temperature regulating. It's so damn soft. It's ethically sourced viscose from bamboo. It's incredible. And the brand was featured on Oprah's favorite things 
things. But before that, it was featured on Mark's favorite things. Like I discovered this brand years ago before I ever even chatted with them about being a sponsor for the podcast. And because I love their product so much, I asked for an exclusive offer for you and you get 40% off site-wide. And now they have pajamas. They have like loungewear. So not only do you get to wrap yourself in the experience of the sheets as clothing, but you then get to get into the bed in that. So you're like double wrapped. And so all you got to do to save 40% off site-wide is use the code GROVES at checkout. So just my last name, G-R-O-V-E-S. So go to CozyEarth.com, C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H dot com and use the code GROVES and you get 40% off all their products. Do you usually work with couples or is it single people? You know what? It, it seems to be a lot of females, although we've worked with males, but it seems to be a lot of females. I think they're moms who are home and busy and it bothers them. And I love when the partner is supportive and they are like, yes, let's do this for our family because you get 10 years ahead in a day or a weekend. But usually what's missing, Mark, is systems, right? Like I call them towns to make it kind of funny when I'm working with people of dog town or baby town or appliance town. And it's not about perfection. It's just about progress. I'm not about perfection. Things get messed up just like a shower every day. You got to go back in the shower and dust yourself off and redo it, you know, but when you have the systems in place, communication is better because then there's no blaming or shaming of where is this, where is that? Well, the leash is in dog town or the tools in tool town, right? Like you should know where to go to find something and things have a place to go back to. It's kind of neat, like a garage. Why do we park the car there? Because that's where it goes, right? It seems so simple, but if there is a place for the keys, whether it's a bin or a bowl or somewhere, then, you know, you guys know always where to find those keys. Now, do you always put them there? 99% of the time you probably will, but sometimes you won't, but at least it has a place to go back to. So then it's easier to tidy up, but things earn the right to be in your house too. And that's like relationships, right? Like not everybody should just be in your life. Things like people should earn their right to be in your life. So you need to look at the things in your house and say, do I use this? Is this intentional or is it just here just because? And if it is, then give it to somebody else. Right, donate it. Okay, the bowl system I like because we have a bowl system for keys or anything car key related. And that's true. That mm-hmm. has made life much simpler. And then there's like the sort of miscellaneous drawer that I think everyone has <laughs> in the kitchen. Is that yeah. fair? That seems to be a common drawer until you enter their lives, perhaps. People call it the junk drawer. I love to organize a junk drawer because usually most of the things in there don't really belong. And why they don't belong is because they don't have a home somewhere else right? There are receipts or invoices or, you know, gift cards. But if you have gift card town, then you'll actually use the gift cards, right? And, and why containers? You can use whatever you want. You can use shoe boxes. You can use diaper boxes. You can use whatever. But things should have a place to go back to. Yeah, dog town too. I mean, Kai was saying the other day, because when we moved to this new place, we don't have a dog town. We had a dog town in the previous place. And she was like, uh, do you have a basket or something that we could put all of Carl's? I feel like she must have taken some training from you or something because she is all about systems. Well, some people need it more than others too, right? Like I think it depends on maybe our emotional regulation, you know, how quickly we flip our lids, right? So I think it depends on our personalities. And if you need it, and your cortisol is up because you don't have it, then there's easy ways to put it in place. But you need a little coaching to start because it's not something, it's not really a skill you're born with. Or if it was easy, you would have done it. That's true. I remember hearing a statement that your bedroom is representative of your mind, like something like that. Mm. And my bedroom was definitely more messy as a kid and a teenager and maybe in my early 20s until I dated a woman who was very tidy. And then it made me become tidier. But what I noticed is that I felt way less stressed, organized. I felt mm. felt much lighter. I feel much lighter when we declutter and we move things and get rid of them. And moving is such an opportunity to get rid of stuff. It is. It is. And we help people when they move. You know, We'll move them and we'll help them declutter as we go. But I, I think that it's a gift to get your children involved and to talk about it. And it also, I think, can project into all areas of life that loss is okay. There's two sides of the coin. And, 
you can't always have happy without crappy and you need to experience that loss, I think. And so letting go can be, you know, for this woman who, who said today, you know, letting go just takes that weight off. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I love helping people, coaching them through it, but I just find that it's beyond just the things in their house. It extends to life and relationships and just an easier way to get through life because life is messy. So have you seen that sort of the relational patterns that follow people, obviously, in their romantic relationships and how they handle conflict, do you see the same correlation in terms of how people keep a house? I know you talked about like if a parent came, you know, was raised in the Great Depression or something, they might hold on to more things. But do you see essentially that sort of trickle down of how parents, you know, held a home is what they teach their kids, et cetera? I think that we can't not hear the words that they say, right? It's almost like feelings. When someone says, a child comes to a parent and says, I'm hungry, and the child says, well, it's not dinner time yet. The child's like, hmm, that's funny. My stomach's rumbling. I feel hungry. And then they try again. I'm hungry. I want a sandwich. Well, no. And if you ask again, you're not getting dessert. So in a home, like we're hearing that as children, Right. And that forms who we are. And I think in a home, if a parent is always saying, no, let's just keep that because you might grow into them. Like, and it's like, what, when I'm 18, mom, like I'm two or something, you know. Or the diet clothes. The diet clothes are a big one. (laughs) People hold on to like clothes that when they were skinnier so that eventually they'll fit them. Up and down, lose weight, gain weight. But hanging on to the clothes doesn't get you the prize. It actually usually gets you further away from it. So I always coach people to put it away in the basement and label it, get it out of your closet so you actually feel lighter and feel like you want to exercise or put on weight, whatever goal you're looking for. But having the clothes there doesn't make the thing happen. Having 18 water bottles doesn't make you a runner right? Putting your shoes on makes you a runner. And I sound like I'm, I'm mean and I'm not mean. Like I'm, I'm very sensitive. No, get savage on here. Let's get our shit thrown out. Come on. I've been there, right? I think everybody's been there and I can relate and you can relate. And so again, it's not perfection, it's progress. And I think it's important to use those words around your kids. Do you, do you love this? Do you use this? Would you buy this again today? Maybe more in kid language. And then take them to the donation center with you and let them see the joy of somebody getting something that's used or shop with them there and see that things can have second lives. And, you know, that's okay. But I don't think when we buy things, we need to think that we're going to hang on to them forever because we spent some money, which is tough environmentally. I mean, it's a balance, right? But then you need to think of those things when you're shopping. If you really are that person that, you know, my brother's zero garbage. Well, yeah, he thinks about that every time he buys something. I'm a little different, but but clutter does leak into all areas of our lives, whether we like it or not. What does it do? Does it make us more agitated, less focused? I think with cortisol, yeah, it would make us anxious. You know, it's a trigger. You see things and you think you, you know, you have to manage the managing of the managing of the stuff. It takes it's- up your unconscious. And well, I think about people that hold on to their ex's shit you know, or like something that I'm like, just get rid of it. And I don't mean like a dog or a kid, but like get rid of the things like old sweaters, Jack. I remember when I think, it was, yeah, Kai, she had like a ex's sweater. I was like, yo, get another sweater. Like, come on. Like, there's lots of sweaters out there. You know, it's so funny. I think it's just like, and don't get me wrong. People can hold on to memories and love cozy things. And I'm not getting in the way of that. But I'm like, there is a time. There is a time. And I think it's like reverse manifesting or manifesting that you often then can't open that window, right? Like it is, if you really want that, that's the tough part is people want that freedom, but they're desperately clinging on to these things. But you have to think about, is this $5 collection of pens times a hundred, is it worth my suffering? Like it's not. And it's funny, Mark, too, I worked with a client a while ago and she did have a bunch of boyfriends things. And after a while, they look at me and they just hold it up and they're, um, and they're like, I know, I know what you're going to tell me. But then they're happier. They're like, yes, get rid of it. Like, so energetically, it takes up space. You can't, you're swiping on Tinder and you still got a fucking picture up or like some old shit. Maybe you're even wearing some jogging pants that belong to him or her or whatever. I guess jogging pants from a woman would be hard to fit on a man, but you know what I mean. 
Yeah. It stops you from moving forward. And I'm not saying minimalism and getting, let's get rid of everything. I have my things that keep me comfortable, but life is easier when you have less to manage. And then you can go out water, you know, paddle boarding, or you can go do water sports. You can do whatever you want because you're not like, oh, I've got to manage all of the things that have spread all over my whole house. (laughs) Yeah. You feel a lot lighter, which makes sense. And I think about that, you know, when I checked out your work, I was interested in the position that you take on why we hold on to things. Like, why do we hold on to things? Because we paid money for them. And we think that holding on to the thing will put the money back in the bank account. So that's a big shopper person will do that. What about people with lots of shoes? Yeah, there's sunk costs. Money's gone. The money is gone the day you bought it. So you either wear it or you don't. And if you don't, then be a philanthropist and go donate it. But don't keep it so no one can use it because there's a lot of people who could. So you just have to shift the perspective to think, hey, like I'm get the dopamine hit from donating instead of keeping it. Perfectionism, people hang on to things because they're paralyzed. They're going to make the wrong decision. So they make no decision at all. There is certainly trauma. And that one is a little trickier, right? You know, the person just passed away. Well, then the grief has, you have to get it through the pipe. And so, you know, I don't really push those people, but at least they can know that there's a chance at getting through it by thinking about the things in a different way and trusting that that person is in their heart. And some people love the smell of a sweater who's passed, somebody who's passed away. And I've worked with a lot of clients like that. And, you know, hanging on to it for a while is healthy for sure until you're ready. But there, you know, there's, you make a mistake. Sometimes you make a bad purchase, right? You bought a pair of really expensive shoes and they don't fit at all, but you keep them because you feel bad that you spent so much money, but that you're never going to wear them. And then you feel guilt and shame every time you see them. Well, I've held on to shoes. There's actually a joke in my guys group that I had an ex buy me these shoes that were like pointy, like elf boots. So that's the joke is that she gave me shoes that I would never be able to meet another woman in again. So I just saw them a couple weeks ago. And in the group chat, someone sent a picture of elf boots just to bring back up that story. But I had those boots in my closet, not because I was holding on to the idea of her, but I felt guilty that I hadn't worn them yet, even though I didn't like them. Like I could have gone ice climbing with these things, you know, they were awful boots. But I think about how so many of us, like like when you th- work with people, what percentage of their shit is useless and should be thrown out? Like what? Give us a like average, Megan go lightly, comes in, lightens your shit. Oh, that's hard. But think about it when you go on vacation. You feel great on vacation because you just don't have all of your stuff. You have your makeup that you like and your favorite book and your laptop and your favorite clothes. Now you need seasonal stuff, but you could live a long time. And again, I'm not a minimalist, but I would say like realistically, I bet 50% or more of what people have, they're never going to use and they could live without. Now that's high. I love it when people get rid of 10% just to know the neural pathway, it's okay. I let it go. I can do it again. I like to start the new way of thinking. Start it. Start the new way of thinking and stop telling the story about the story. You talked about it, Mark. I want to hear about the relationship between the heart matters of the heart too, because you said, I think a really good reel that you did is about getting in your own way. And I see that a lot with people of like, I want this so badly, but then they're totally in your own, their own way. So I put that in my how-to guide way up front in the beginning is get out of your own way. Do you want this or not? Because if you want it, follow the steps and you got it. You got me. I'm an expert. I can help you do this, but you need to get out of your own way. Do you notice people change their life as well? Like once they clean up their shit, all of a sudden they pack up their husband or their wife and they're broken up or like, you know, like, does that? Well, I think it makes you more capable to, it's just, I mean, it's the, our brains are more organized and we're not taking inventory. There's something called duration path outcome. There's a neuroscientist. I know him. His name's Andrew Huberman and he came up. Yeah. So Andrew talks about, I was at SLN with him about, I don't know, seven years ago. And I just like was, I couldn't get enough of his information, but he talked about duration path outcome of your brain is always predicting and trying to think duration path outcome. How long is this going to last? How am I going to get there? And what's the outcome going to look like? 
And duration path outcome, when you're doing it all the time, is insomnia. So when you see a pile of clutter or something that you know you should get rid of, but you're like, eh, not today, your brain actually is working on it over time at night, doing duration path outcome, keeping you awake. So get it out or hide it even, but deal with it. So I have a friend who recently got married and they found their partner on the app Hinge. And it had me thinking like, when was the last time I used a dating app? And when I did, it was actually Hinge. The reason I really like Hinge is because I like the intention the company has. They say it's designed to be deleted. They want you not to stay on the app because they want you to find your person. And because of that intention, they've designed the app to ensure that you date with deep intention. It allows you to find great dates through profile features that help you date more intentionally. And when I think about the concept of intentional dating, it's really about knowing who you are, what you're looking for, expressing those desires and wants to others, especially early. When I work with people, it's so interesting. They'll say, I don't wanna share what I want because if I share what I want and declare it, the other person might want that and I'll lose the one. I'm like, but the one will want what you want. So with Hinge, it makes it really easy. They ask you what you want right from the start through their dating intentions feature. So more specifically with the feature, you can add what kind of relationship you're looking for. You can say what you're looking for in a life partner, a long-term partner, a short-term relationship, or whatever you're seeking. You can also share more about your intentions and desires in the backstory section. So you can go a little deeper on it and include what your values are, what your deal breakers are. That's so, so important. And just so that what you seek is crystal clear and the people who are seeking you can find you. This leaves less room for confusion or assumptions, and it helps you meet people who are aligned, who are on the same page as you. So go download Hinge today, share your dating intentions to find someone worth deleting the app for. I have a couple piles of things I was going to give away that I just haven't driven to the place yet, and I see them every day. And that's the thing too is, Yeah, get it. Like I have a challenge for August where I'm asking people in small spaces, but really in any space to get rid of 10 things today, pick them, get them out, but take them today. You got to have a donation box in your house. It says donation or a bin, and then they go in there. And I keep thinking about how this is the same with relationships, but it's just taking action, right? Moving the dial forward, getting closer to what you really want. I could see that that level of lack of discipline within the way that we orient to our home and holding on to stuff would be so correlated to the way that we hold on to behaviors and I mean not just stuff but like familiarity you know like as you were saying that sort of correlate the correlate to this is the life I'm familiar with I don't love it I don't love the way I feel I don't love my relationship I don't love the way I show up but I, I know it's predictable. Like every day I'm going to wake up and da 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 is going to happen and I'm going to still feel this way. I'm still going to be in this relationship. You know, I haven't exactly changed my own behaviors. And we're like holding on to this. I think that is honestly one of the greatest sources of pain is knowing you're capable of more or feeling better and you're not. Because everyone who feels shitty really knows at the end of the day that if they took some level of action, there would be a change. And as soon as, that's why exercise is so powerful or cleaning your, decluttering your home because you immediately, it's a hundred percent immediate feedback. That's where like setting a boundary can be really hard because it takes a bit for that to set in too. Yeah. And you have to wait for the person to come into your life or whatever that experience. But exactly what you were saying is how much easier is it to throw out a shovel that doesn't work because of how it's designed and it's broken at the bottom but you might need two in case you're shoveling at the same time. So how much easier is it to throw out that shovel to get that feeling of lightness than to throw out an emotion or a behavior? You know, like I think it's easier, but it actually leads you to letting go of all sorts of things because it's baby steps. And then your brain's like, that was okay. That felt good. I'm alive. I didn't get eaten. You know, I'm not going to eat anybody and I can do that again. Yeah, it feels like you feel the lightness of the declutter. So then you're like, what else weighs a lot? Mm-hmm. This feels good. It's like the reverse dopamine, right? Then all of a sudden, what you thought was, you know, hanging on to it to have more. When you let go, you get more. And the dopamine's actually working the other way. But you've never had a taste of it because you've never done it, really. But we all know it feels good to let go. Yeah, dopamine from less. That's really fascinating to think about. Like we are so programmed to purchase or get more accumulate, you know, materialism. 
But the idea of actually cleaning up your life and that being a hit, which is so true. Like when you leave a relationship that feels heavy or you finally have a hard conversation and it's off your plate and you just feel like a million pounds have been lifted. And the thing about clutter is we, how many times, like, let's think about that shovel. So you park in the garage every day and you see it. So you're kind of thinking about it every day. You're reviewing it every day, but you're not doing it. So it's almost like torturous, right? And your subconscious mind then, you know, this makes me sad. And that's why I love to help is women will open up a cupboard and they're like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I'm like such a bad mom. I'm so behind and all of the negative things that come up that your subconscious brain starts to believe, but your cupboard's just messed up. You just don't have a system. You just have a little too much stuff. You know, you just need a little help, but you're not a bad person. What happens when two people have different organizing styles or like different, like my wife and I have found some, I still know that her belief, although I'd love to validate this with her, is that hers is the right way. And mine is just like more cluttery and messy as where I do not believe that. I believe that they're just different, although hers feels lighter. I'm not the clutter police either. Like some people very rarely, I think I've had one person in three years say something negative about what I'm saying. Maybe I don't put put it out there enough, but I'm not saying one is way better than the other in a way. Like I, I say there's a cost to it, but styles, different levels are different. You might be, she might be a micro organizer and you're kind of a macro organizer where you're like, if I hit the basket, that's great you know, and she might want the basket into sections with gloves and mitts and boots. And, but I think you, here's something important. I think you have to have the conversation, like talk about the four horses of the apocalypse coming into your relationship. If you start to criticize the person about what they're doing, or like you have to talk about it because you're living in the same house and it will ruin your relationship and eat away at you your respect and everything. So have the conversation and just tell them it's important. Just say it's important to me. And these are the costs, but a lot of people aren't even aware of the costs, so they can't find the words, but I'll tell you on my page what they are, time, space, energy, relationships, physical health, mental health, you know, there's a cost. And so if you can say these things, then you can maybe found, find, you know, a common ground and then parents dumping things on kids. There's another one. My mom tried to give me some stuff the other day. Hey, do you want these glasses and blah, blah that I collected? Nope. Do you want them when I die? No, I don't. I love you, but I don't want your crystals, which I'm sure someone else will be like, I love that stuff. But, you know, it's the idea of like, I'll just think about you. I'll just like watch a video with you or something in it. And I could drink out of one chalice, maybe. (laughs) Like the grail, my mother's grail. I'll have her cremated and form some sort of chalice. Sorry, mom, I love you. I I won't do that. Think about the guilt that some people have and that the parents have had on them their whole lives. And they're like, I have to take this. Like, I'm scared to communicate. You're an awesome communicator, right? And you're not really afraid and you know boundaries. But imagine not having those cards and then stuff keeps coming in and you keep taking it and driving truckloads over to your house yes, is their shit. It happens. It happens. So I always coach clients to say, for goodness sake, the first question you could ask and say to them is, you can tell me no. I'm going to offer it to you. I will not feel offended if you say no, but I feel like I want to ask you just because then I don't want you to be mad at me if you regret that I didn't ask if you wanted your brownie uniform and all its badges. But oh my God, my mom just gave me my cub blanket with badges on it. Did you have many badges? Well, it wasn't like the like accolade strip thing. It was just like a camping like hood blanket, which I mean, I'm never going to use it. Sorry, mom. But how do we say like, I mean, it's you're, you're right. If I'm the one offering it, I go, Hey, do you want this thing? Actually, this is great. I want to explore this. But if I'm like, Hey, do you want this thing? You can say no, if you don't, I just want to make, I like that. That's great from the offerer. But what about the person who you're saying it to? Like, how do you respond to an offer when it's not like that? When it's like, hey, I brought a box of your shit or I bought a box of stuff and I'm going to give it to you. I just did a reel about that of like seven kind ways that are respectful 
to handle that situation because I think a lot of people get stuck with their parents and the stuff and it can ruin their lives. And the parents don't know that they're doing a bad thing. They think they're doing a good thing because that's how they were raised or the reverse of the kid who never gets their stuff out of the parents' house and the parents too afraid to say, get your stuff out by this day or, but meanwhile, mom and dad are staying in the huge house with a mortgage and they could be in a condo because they have all the rooms full of their kids' stuff because they won't get it out. It gets, yeah, it's so true, but it comes down to, I think, learning like you coach, I coach on how to find those words and examples of what I see in real life in real people's homes. That's relatable to help people get through these dilemmas that are a big deal to people. Okay, so let's explore this camping blanket slash hood thing that I have. Okay, so let me give you the origin of it. That's it, actually. That's the origin. Yeah, I wore it at Cubs. It has badges that have like the 1988 Olympics, 19, I don't even know. It has a bunch of random shit. And my mom brought it to me when her and my dad came down and visited and met Jasper. And she was probably having some sort of nostalgic. She held on to so many of my things as a kid. And I actually didn't even realize she left it till I saw it. And I was like, oh shit, she left that shit behind. <laughs> now what am I going to do with it? And here's my thought process. I was like, oh yeah, it's got some badges on it. Maybe those are worth something now. Like 28 cents, let's be honest. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll use this sometime around a fire. Mm -hmm. Jasper might like to see it. Did that one come to your mind? <laughs> yeah, it was for all the like things you talk about were in my head. Okay, so let's do we, I keep it or not. Okay, so what are the three things you should ask yourself? Do I love this thing? Do you love it? No, it's just like a blanket with some badges on it. Would you go out and buy it if you saw it in a thrift store? Not from somebody else. That's super retro. I need to have that. Yeah, like I wouldn't be against something like that, but probably not. Like I definitely wouldn't buy someone else's, that's for sure. Because it has badges that are personal, you know? Will you use it? Like, it does it have a function? I would like almost never use it. And then I have a bit of guilt about the idea of throwing it out. So I take a picture of it. Take a picture of it. And if you'd never seen the physical item and your mom brought you a book that was like this skinny of Mark's all the things in his life, you would probably get that same feeling in your heart of like, oh my God, I remember that. Like, it's not about touching it. It's about seeing it in the memories. So to me, I think those memory books are great to do for kids because then you're not burdening them with all the physical things. And they're likely not going to get mad at you because you, I don't have the physical thing, but the memory is still there and it's conversation and it's respectful. Now I'm saying, don't get rid of everything of your kids. You can keep a few things and give it to them. But but pictures are good, right? And you're okay with pictures, but now you're left with this dilemma of this thing that feel guilty throwing out. And like, I just hate the cost mentally that things cost us. And you didn't even know it existed. No, like if she had said, oh, that thing I donated, I would have been like, well, cool. Like I never would have had the like physical relationship to it again, you know? Yeah, but if it was a musical score and you were a musician and she found it and been signed by Ella Fitzgerald or something when she was young and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to frame that and put it up. Then I think that's great because it's in your life and it brings you joy. But yeah, that reminded me of something else. When you touch something, that's why sales people put things at eye level in a store. So you'll touch it and you'll want it. So I actually don't let my clients touch everything when they're deciding. Because if you touch that blanket, you probably want it even more. So I'll kind of hold things for my clients and say, what do you think about this? Ask them the questions. And sometimes you can't decide right away. So you set it aside and pick something easier. And you know, I'm, it's not an all or nothing, right? I'm saying you don't have to go through the box and get rid of everything. Sometimes you're ready to get rid of things and sometimes you're ready to hang on to things. But, but I think it's valuable to think hard about it of what purpose is it serving? Did, has this earned its right to be in my life? Is it important? Or is it just something that's going to clutter it up? Such a great question to ask about people. I think about Brene Brown has that and I don't mean that like people need to earn their spot, but like Renee Brown has that question when it's the difference between oversharing and vulnerability that we should ask ourselves, have they earned the right to my story? Mm. And I think about that, like, is there a mutual level of values, appreciation, respect, whatever it might be? And the other part that comes up is the guilt of tossing it or donating it because my mom held it for so long. 
Oh gosh. Yeah. That, so that's a big one, right? I collect, I don't collect corks, but I talk about this in one of my presentations of, well, when I worked with Selena Gray, that night was so good. We had some champagne at the end and I learned so much and I threw out the bottle of champagne and then I went to touch the cork and I was like, Hmm, that was a good night. Sentimentality. Maybe I should write her name on the cork and keep it. Mm, that was an expensive bottle of champagne. It was called Rich. You know, maybe I'll put it on my cabinet and people will think I can afford that champagne all the time. All the things. It costs money just in case, hey, maybe I can repurpose this and make a table out of it out of corks. You know, like people tell all the stories. Do I collect corks? Do I love this cork? No. Will I use this cork? No. It's splayed. I can't even get it back in. And would I go <laughs> buy a cork? No. So then the cork's gone. It was easy. But if I collected corks, and if you collect corks, great. If you have a cork town, great. But you have a town for them and that's great and you love them. But if you're just, if they're all over your house, you throw them away right away. But my point is, if I collected corks and I passed away, do you think my kids would have an easy time getting rid of mom's cork collection that they think I loved? No, actually, I just threw corks in the thing because I didn't know what to do with them. So when somebody passes away, it gets even harder than to throw because you you think that it was really important to the person and they didn't care and they're not there to tell you. So then it is really hard. That makes sense. I feel like there's so many layers to it. You know, now I look at that. Yeah, I look at that blanket and I'm like, I have a bit of resentment that it was handed to me now that because you brought that up of like, no, it's not bad, but it's like, I can feel that sense of resentment in that, like, oh, now I'm dealing with this shit. Why not you just get rid of it? Then I wouldn't have to think about it, which don't get me wrong. I'm an adult. I can navigate it, but I'm going to have to talk to her about it because that feels like a good thing to just share. Just being like, hey, you, I'm so grateful you held on to these things for us. Like, I know it comes with such a beautiful intention and let's just go through my stuff and the stuff that you still have and will do a yay or nay. If you want to hold it for you, you can. And there'll be things I don't want to hold for me and it has nothing to do with not appreciating you. And what a beautiful thing to spend that hour or two hours with her. She's probably been waiting to show you those things her whole life. Like it's interesting why as parents we hang on to things because when our kids turn 16, they don't want any of it, right? And then it becomes a collection and then you have a hard time throwing it out because you've kept it so long. Oh, my mom kept some of my clothes as a toddler. And so she brought them down for Jasper, which actually I got to say is actually pretty cool because Jasper will be in similar pictures that I was in, which will be a really neat thing to recreate. But I was like, man, she's held on to these things for like, I'm 44, so like 42 years, which is wild that they've moved houses once. So that means they trucked all that shit to a new place. And man, now I just think about like for you listening, how much shit have you trucked around thinking? Like I consider all the questions you're asking and they're not, as I was asked that about the blanket, it's like, they're not easy questions to answer, but there's a real opportunity to clean up so much in our life and amazing how that correlates. It gets a different conversation going that's not about the story in the past, but it's it's three new questions to get you out of that story so that you stand a chance at meeting your goal. And if you can't get rid of it, fine, that's fine. But I think it's better to stick to those questions than to keep telling the story and supporting something that isn't even the ballpark of asking the right questions. Does that make sense? And some people say, well, I kept my wedding dress. Like, you know, they're like, I don't like your, your post because I don't want to get rid of my wedding dress because my husband and I dress up every year and get back into it and have dinner. Great. Because you're doing something with it. And it's, it's great. But for the woman who's in its garage and it's in a $50 box that's air sealed and fancy with gold writing and you're never going to do anything with it, it's kind of too bad that it didn't get donated sooner to somebody who might have used it. Back in the retro style now. Yeah, I don't know. But that that holding on, like that specific, especially about a wedding dress, you know, I think about you got to clean your shit up. Like you got to clean up your stuff because if you don't, you're not going to let goodness come into your life. Like it creates space. And I think about the classic, what you said on the internet, one person's like, that post doesn't fit me. It's like, yeah, welcome to being an adult. Like not everything's going to fit for you. Not every message is going to align with you. You don't have to always go and tell people their message is bad because you don't agree with it. Because there's a lot of people, I had an engagement ring for like four years. I never looked at it. It sat in a box 
when I was like, shit, I'm sitting on a couple G. I could sell this thing and have some cash. What am I doing? I took a loss on the ring. I think I was afraid to do that. But, you know, at the end of the day, people must get good deals on engagement rings that go for resale because like energetically, you know. Wedding dress. Well, no. Yeah, there's some good things that books, you know, books, that's a tricky one with people of, do I get rid of my books? Do I keep them? I read them. I have such good memories of them, but the cost of moving books and the space of keeping books and books are beautiful words on a page that someone can reuse at any time. They can buy them. They can, you know, you can sell them, you can donate them, but people do have a hard time letting go of the books. They have a hard time letting go of their university books, textbooks, because it identifies who they are, but you're not your textbook. You have the degree regardless of the textbook. Textbooks suck anyways. Like they're so old. They'll come out with a new, everything that I learned in university, I mean, very little of it probably still stands. I don't know. But like that is it. Books are beautiful. And I'm definitely not getting in the way of Kai holding on to her books. I listen to books. I listen to Audible and I don't have to do anything with my Audible library. It's just on an app which I really like. But there are a few books that I'm like, I'm going to read that. And I still haven't read it. Yeah, but you've made a decision looking at it. You know, some people have 700 books, so they're paralyzed to even start of what to do with their library. You know, and then they move them around and or CDs and DVDs. and. Oh my God, CDs and DVDs. I remember I donated mine to a friend because he was like, I'll take your DVDs. I'm like, like a hundred, you're never going to use these. So that, I mean, I put that in my how-to guides, like there's pages of like each how-to guide covers a different room. And then there's like the conundrum page that you're going to run into in that room and common things that maybe people should think about to, if they really want to declutter, these are some things to think about when you're dealing with those things. Awesome. Well, Megan, this is, I'm sure going to spark a lot of conversations for a lot of couples and also for a lot of people who are single, who are listening, who are like, shit, I want to invite some new love into my life. I got to get rid of some of that, those old pointy elf boots that my partner bought me or whatever is, you know, the stuff that they're like making sure you never get into a relationship again because you're still wearing a sweater. So And or is tracks too bad. Yeah. Oh yeah. Tracks, all the things. So where can people find more of you and these how-to guides? So my Instagram is, my last name is Go Lightly. So my Instagram is Go Simplified, Go Simplified. And my website is Go hyphen Simplified. And you can find the how-to guides on my website. You can find them on my Instagram. I talk about them all the time. And that's what I, I talk about on my Instagram is just trying to help people with what I do and what I've seen and what I've done. Awesome. Megan, thanks so much for your time. And thanks for inviting us to declutter our houses and of course our minds. Thank you. I'm honored to have spent this time with you and I feel like I'm talking more slowly and relaxed just because of you. So thank you. 